Hi, Flying House. Hey, as we're finding our seat right now, can, can, you, can you let me know if you're happy to be in the house of the Lord today? Can you let me know that? Yeah, you know what I like. You know what I like. A lot of celebration, a lot of cheering. That's like, that's what I keep on asking for, and that's what I love to hear. Before we go any further, I'd like to take this opportunity, this opportunity to introduce myself if you're a little newish here. My, my name is Elliot. My wife Tiffany and I, who's leading Growth Track right now, uh, my wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Give it up for yourselves, because you're awesome. Go ahead. You can do it. Yeah. Oh. Okay, you're humble. That's what I like. Uh, you're humble. That's cool. That's a good thing. Now, before we get started here, before I, I introduce my good friend, um, I, I want to I do y'all a favor, let you into uh, a little window into my world here, um, because, you, you know, we haven't been pastors forever. You probably guessed that. We've been pastoring for just about six and a half years, and when, when Tiffany and I started pastoring this church, um, it was rough, you know. It, I, I won't lie to you. It was it was a really hard thing to do. We didn't we didn't know what we needed to know. We we didn't have the skills that we needed to have. And you know, we're still in process. We're still learning too. But when we were first started, there was a little group in our in our four square movement that we're a part of. They had this little group called the the under forty group. And you know, they got a whole special group for pastors under 40 for weeks so we can all hang out with each other and we won't break anything. I guess that's what they think. Who knows what they think. But they got us all together in one in one little place. You know, California, Nevada, Utah, there was like 20 of us just saying, all right? We're we're a, we're a special kind of people. Um, and I still qualify for that group, by the way. I'm just, <laughs> I got you. Um, but this is where I met Pastor Anthony, who I'm going to tell you about right now, it was because we were in that group. We, we started going to that group. We were about a month in to our pastoral leadership. And like I said, you know, we just didn't we just didn't have the stuff. You know, we didn't have the stuff. We still don't have the stuff, but we keep on trying. And we were in that in that place. And it was like the Lord, um, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't all holy like this, but it was the Lord gave me an impression. And you can picture it like it was like boo, a light went. Boo, Everybody say it was a crazy little moment where God showed me, hey, I, I want you to go make friends with this guy. Just reach out to him, text him, see what's up. And that's the way kind of God talks to me, like a, like a little bit of slang. And so that's what I did. I reached out to him. And, and I was expecting, because I don't know, I've never been a pastor before, so I, I think it's like, oh, okay, I'll, um, okay, uh, Mr. Elliot, I'll, uh, I'll uh, pencil you in three months from now. It's going to be great, and uh, I'll get you into my busy schedule. But that's not what he said at all. He said, matter of fact, you want to learn something? Yeah, you can come down and you can hang out with me for like three days and I'll make my son sleep on the couch and you can stay in his room and you can come and spend some time with me. And I was like, oh, this is going to work. <laughs> this is going to work. So this, this man, basically his wife Mandy and, and, and himself, they, they, they took us in like family and they, they showed us, you know, everything they knew. And let me tell you what stood out the most, and this is something he's not going to brag on himself about because he got a big church and everything and all that stuff, blah, blah, blah. But let me, let me show you what I saw right away. When I, when I stayed with him, when I woke up the next morning, um, I woke up at 6 to find him and his wife already out at the kitchen table praying and reading their Bible together. I was like, oh, <laughs> that's why God has blessed them so much. This man is one of the most disciplined men, hardworking men, hardworking in ministry, and it's just my pleasure and honor to introduce to you my close personal friend, Anthony Flores. He's going to preach with you today, all right? Come on. Number two, come on. All right, all right. Well, hey, you know what? I got I to gotta just love on your pastor. You can't get better people than Tiffany and Elliot. They're just great people. My wife loves his wife. They actually probably talk more than we do. Um, that's because they talk longer when they actually start talking. So I'm really short on the phone. I'm more of an eyeball. How many eyeball to eyeball people are you here? I don't really do the texting in the phones. I got to see you. I got to eat chips and salsa with you. You know what I mean? I don't know if I'm alone like that, but. <clears throat> that's pretty much where I'm at. But matter of fact, if you do have chips and salsa, I'll be there for a couple hours with you. So uh, I just don't do real the whole fun thing. But I love them. And, and, you know, one of the things that I admire so much about, you know, your pastors is they're so hungry. Like you have pastors that are out there learning, growing, wanting to hear the voice of Jesus. Um, this is the same pastoral couple where I said, hey, I'm flying out to Texas I'm going to go to Pastor Robert's church to a conference. I think you guys should come. And they hopped on a flight. And they just, you know, I got us a, a place to stay. And, and so we got to go to the conference together. And so they're just so hungry for the things of God. And I travel to a lot of churches. And you don't always see that. You don't always see pastors who are so teachable and so hungry. So I just really want to encourage you 
uh, with that. They're just uh, outstanding people. They're, they're phenomenal pastors, but they're even better believers. Amen. So, hey, I want to show you a picture of my family who I think my wife is tuning in right now. Hi, babe. Okay. So she's at, uh, we, we, we're at one church, multiple locations. She's at one location uh, today. And, and they're actually all done with their church services. So she was able to tune in. So <clears throat> it's my wife and then you have my oldest daughter, who my wife is holding. Hey, babe, don't tell Melinda and the kids, okay, that I put their picture up here. They get mad at me. So she's 18, and then my other daughter is 16, and then my son is 14. Go ahead and look at your neighbor and say, he's broke. Go ahead and say it. <laughs> yeah, I ain't got no money. I ain't got no money. And so I know, I know the second thing that popped up into your head was like, man, did she marry up. I mean to tell you, she got a winner when she got me, Yes. You know, I'm just kidding. I'm just playing with you. You're going to laugh a lot today, okay? So, yeah. So, nope. So, I got, I got, a, I got two drivers in the house. My son is just not uh, old enough to drive, but I'm, I'm almost a free man. I'm almost a free man. My insurance is through the roof, but I'm almost a free man, and I'm trying to debate, you know, do I keep paying that insurance or do I, or, you know, or do I stop them from driving? And I just about got my wife back, and so I don't care what it costs me. I'm going to find the money. They are going to continue to drive because I get my sweet thing back, and we're ready to hit the road. So uh, I got wonderful kids. Um, as you can tell, two beautiful daughters. So I had to make a quick decision. Um, I had to decide whether or not I wanted to do prison ministry. So I, I've come to the conclusion I'll be okay with prison ministry, family in there anyway. So we'll just call it a reunion. So thank you for showing that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I just make sure you with me. Hey, so I got to tell you a story for all of you who like to Google things. Do I have a story for you? Now, you're probably not going to believe me, okay? You're probably not going to believe me, but I promise you this is actual and factual. I cannot make this up. Matter of fact, Matthew, uh, a young man who was in last service, came up to me. The first thing he said was, could you believe that story? He goes, when I first read it, I thought it was fake too. And I'm like, I know, it's crazy. A guy by the name of Robert Comer, Robert Comer, was on death row. It's a true story. Robert Comer, Google death row. And they asked him, they said, Robert, um, you get two things. You get a last meal and you get your last words. Now, I don't know about you, but the last meal is easy. I already know I'm going, I'm going steak, and, you know, steak and shrimp. You know, give me baked potato, fully loaded, sour cream chives, bacon bits, hello. Right? I mean, I got some garlic bread. And then because I'm a bigger guy, we can go meals, okay? So then I'm going to be like, give me a torta, some carne asada. I mean, I'm ready. You go, we're going to blend it all today for a last meal. And so they said, okay, you got your last meal. And then they said, hey, listen, right before you get your last words, so you really want to think about this. So I'm thinking, man, last words, this is important. You know, do I tell my wife I love her? Do I say something to the kids? You know, if I'm on death row, do I tell the family I'm sorry? I kid you not. Like, true story. His last words before they executed him was, Raiders. And he died. So as a Raider fan, as a Raider fan, I was conflicted. Do I say, right on, that's my dude? Or do I go, what were you thinking? Your last words. So really half of my church was celebrating with me. The other half were Niner fans and they were booing me. I mean, so I don't know. But last words, did you know Jesus gave us last words? Now, if we're not careful, we'll think it's in the book of Matthew or in the book of Luke, right, where he says, go, therefore, make disciples. That's actually not his last words, although those are good words and those are words we are to live by. But if you open your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 1, and we're going to go at verse 8, you're going to see Jesus' last words, okay? Now, just to set the scene a little bit, um, the, the 11 apostles and a few onlookers were hanging out with Jesus. Uh, this is Acts chapter 1, verse 1. And Luke begins to give us his investigative report. He begins to tell us the scenery and what was taking place. So he says, in my former book, O Theophilus, verse 1, I began to write to you about what Jesus began to do and to teach, verse 2, up until the day he was ascended. That's verse 3. So Luke is saying, let me set the table here. We're all gathered around. We're at the Mount of Olives where Jesus was, just right up the hill from Jerusalem. And, <clears throat> and, and, and so he says, listen, at this time, the disciples... Looked to Jesus, probably Peter, because Peter was the outspoken one. And they said to Jesus, Jesus, is this now the time that you're going to restore the kingdom? 
I mean, like you've conquered death, hell, and the grave. Is it over? What could we expect? So the disciples are wanting to go real deep. They're wanting to go real deep. They want something profound. They want, they want the book of Revelation explained before it was ever written. I mean, they want to know who is the, what is the mark of the beast? Who is the woman with the 12 horns and the 12 beasts of the 12 kids? I mean, like, what do we got going on here? An A&E special, a History Channel sitcom here, okay? And Jesus, instead of going deep, he goes real shallow. He goes just real surface. He puts the cookies on the bottom shelf, and he says, it is not for me to tell you the times and the seasons which the Lord has appointed. But verse 8, he says, but you shall receive power when that of the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be my witness in all of Jerusalem, Judea, and all of and all Samaria to the ends of the world. So in other words, you're going to receive this power, this power that I'm going to give you. Look at your neighbor and say, it's all about you today. Go ahead and tell them it's all about you. Go ahead and tell them it's all about you. If you're sitting next to another person, say, it's all about you, too, and where you're taking me to lunch. Come on. I'm going to have you out before the Baptists are done. We're going to get to the buffets before everybody. So this sermon is all about you. Let me pray for us. Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity to gather in your most holy name. Father, it is my prayer that as you speak to me, you speak through me it's for the blessing and the benefit of your people. In Jesus' name. We all said? Amen. So duct tape. Duct tape. Who here has got something being held together at their house or their vehicle with duct tape? You got duct tape working in your house anywhere? Yeah, you got duct tape? Okay, so does anybody know the origins of duct tape? So now they say, I mean, we don't have the full details, but they say duct tape was invented right after World War I. And duct tape was used for a variety of reasons, mainly because it's pretty water resistant. The adhesive and the, and the strands and the fabric strands that are in it is very water resistant. And so <clears throat> right, about, uh, right about the beginning of World War II and at the end of World War II, it started becoming very popular amongst the GIs, using it for their weapons, their bags, and all this stuff. So when it, when it finally came back around right at the end of World War II, um, there was this little startup uh, type of company business starting to happen called HVAC, in which, you know, central heating and air... And they were doing this thing called duck work. So it's not D-U-C-K-T-A-P-E, it's D-U-C-T. So this guy who was like, hey, this air ducting is very important and we need something to tie it together. Tie it together. So he actually bought the patent. He, uh, I think he purchased it, I think they said from 3M or one of the other manufacturers, like a Johnson & Johnson. Bought, purchased the patent and he said, this is great, this is what I've been missing. Because this thing called heating and air was starting to really take off a little bit, right? But then he found out, unbeknownst to him, duct tape does not work for air ducking. It actually breaks down. So I did a little investigative reporting because I like to do so. And so I went back to my friendly advisor called Google, and I say, how many uses for duct tape? Right now, there are a 1,001 uses for duct tape. Go ahead and pull out your phone, ladies. Get to your Pinterest board and go Pinterest. Use some duct tape. That'll keep you busy for a week right there. So all men are off the hook for honeydews because your wives will be looking at how to use duct tape, right? But the one thing that the man purchased this for and the one thing the man hoped it would work for, it doesn't do. Sounds a little bit like the church. We do a lot of things well, but the one thing we're supposed to be doing we have become ineffective at doing. Now, watch this. Not going to be a real beat you up type of sermon. It's going to be more informational than anything else. This all makes perfectly good sense, right? So I went to my uh, I went to my 20 year class reunion. Now, watch this. I'm a native boy. I am from Stockton. I went to Lincoln High School in Stockton. And just because I'm in Lodi, I got to throw it out there. You guys never beat us in anything when I was in Stockton. It was quite glorious. Trojan till I die. Here we go. Now apparently we can't beat anybody in anything. So it's a far cry from where I started. So I, I'm local. I'm, I'm a local boy here. My, my, I have half siblings, and they all went to Lodi High or Toke or to John Elliott. So uh, my younger siblings went to John. Did I get that wrong? Was it John? I know it's one of the schools. Jim Elliott, yeah. Jim, John, I think they're all the same right there. And then they went to the Assembly of God uh, school right here too. So 
family all around here, all my family, both sides, mom and dad, were all right here, Lodi, Galt, Stockton. So pretty local. I went to my 20-year class reunion, right? I went to my 20-year class reunion. Now remember, I'm a pastor, I'm a preacher, I start churches, this is what I do. So I walk in, and I ain't seen people since high school. Now when I left high school, uh, I wasn't exactly in the church. I was more like anti-church, okay? Matter of fact, the more people that went to church was the less clients I was going to have, if you, that makes any sense. So I show up to my 20-year class reunion, and all of you have been to class reunions. You know, you do what I do. We all do the same thing. Just nobody wants to admit it. You want to compare yourself to everybody else. Did I age well? Am I doing good financially? You walk into the room, and you just start scoping out people. And I was like, man, somebody's had a hard life, right? And so, you know, you're just having a good time. And I sit down at the, you're going to laugh a lot, trust me. So it's okay. I'm just, I'm a funny person, okay? You just got to trust me. And so I sit down at the table, and I'm, I'm hanging out with some old friends who I ain't seen in a long time. And one of my friends, uh, uh, Janice, she comes over, uh, Janice, she comes over. She is now a, a dentist. So she does the whole veneers, fake teeth, the whole night. I mean, she's, she's gifted. She did really good. But she was always really smart, just great person. So she sits down, and we're talking to another friend who is actually at that time running Christian camps. And I love what took place next. Oh, this is glorious. I didn't get to tell it in the first service. So Janice looks at this girl, not to be confused with my wife, because they have the same name, but her name is Mandy. And they call her Amanda or Mandy, depending on how long you've known her. And so she looks at her and she goes, hey, Amanda, how come you never invited? Now, listen, I have a different name, okay, but it is the real name. My family was here at the last service. Nobody calls me Anthony, not in the 209. My name is Chopper. That's my name, okay? So just got to keep that in mind. You say Anthony, they'll have no idea who I am. Got to go by Chopper. So Janice looks at Mandy and says, why didn't you ever invite Chopper to church? You were a Christian your whole life. So me, just sitting there being innocent, trying to play coy, I happened to just say something like this. Why didn't you invite me? Did you want me to go to hell? You wanted me to burn forever? What type of Christian are you? Oh, it felt awesome. Like, I mean, she was nine months pregnant. I didn't care. I just kept giving it to her. I'm just teasing. So she looks, and I'll never forget these words. You ready? She said, I never thought he would go. Well, she's probably right. That was pretty accurate, though, because I wasn't going. I wasn't going. But it's interesting because I think we write people off, and Jesus wants to write them in. I think we do. And so we ended up having a great time. We just had a great conversation. And it just reminds me of what our number one job and priority is to do. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we've got a serious case of the grunts. Well, what do you mean? You ever go to the gym and you see those really, really extremely buff people like with muscles on their ears? wearing the half skimpy shirts, and they're just flexing. Here's the question, go up and ask him, what's the muscle for? No, what's it for? Like, are you, are you picking up cars without a jack? Do you rip out trees? Do you move large boulders for, for landscaping? No, I'm serious. Like, like, why? Like, why do you really need, you know, Thighs that where you can't wear pants anymore. Like, what, what's the purpose? Are you following where I'm going? But I feel like that's the church sometimes. We have all these other things, but the one thing, the one thing he called us to, let's, let's, let's dive into the one thing. So, message is all about you. The very first thing he starts off with is that what? You will receive power. You will receive power. You will receive power. When I think of power, I think of what the actual Greek word is. It's called dunamis. And depending on which Greek professor you had, it may be dunamis, right? But that word translated into the Latin, into English, is dynamite. This explosive power. This, 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 this power that moves mountains and heals sick and raises the dead. And so I have a friend who pastors in the Bay Area. He's in Pleasanton. And I told him, hey, bro, one time I'd like for you to take me to Palo Alto, to the Stanford Research Center where they work on heart patients, and, and they do a really phenomenal job. And I want you to take me to the fourth floor where the most critical of the critical people are. And I want you to drop me off because I believe this power 
lives on the inside of me, and I'm just going to walk by people who are near death, and I'm going to pray over them in Jesus' name, and they're going to get up and rip off the EKGs, and they're going to be dancing in the hallway. It's going to be amazing. And that's probably not going to happen. It's probably not going to happen. Anytime you go looking to put that power on display, you usually miss the miracles every day. See, I think the miracles in the mundane, I think the miracles in the everyday things that God is calling us to do, I think the miracles you going to work tomorrow, and for that single mom who's struggling just with groceries for the kids, it's you going and buying groceries, knocking on the door, and then when you open the door, you realize her baby's been sick for a month. And I think God meets you in the miracle of the mundane because when you as a believer go to pray for her baby, I believe God will heal that baby because you were getting your hands into the thick of it. See, this power isn't to be on display so all eyes could be on me, bright lights and mics and cameras. The power comes on us that we might be an effective witness. The power comes on us that we might be able to help people in the everyday. I think the power is in a smile. I think the power is in an open door. I think the power is turning the other cheek. I think when we meet God there, he begins to unfold to us the miracles in everyday life. But you'll receive power. But you'll receive power. There's a, there's a no-hassle guarantee that when you're doing the Lord's work, you'll get the Lord's provision and you'll receive the Lord's power. That's why I see the most miracles in my life is when I'm just being a Christian. When I'm going the extra mile for the poor, when I'm going the extra mile for the desolate, when I'm going the extra mile for those who are disenfranchised and ostracized, when I'm going the extra mile for these people who are lost and without hope, when I go the extra mile, God seems to meet me with the miracles. And boy, have I seen them. But if I go chasing the miracle and wanting God to perform like he's a puppet on a string, it never happens. But it's there when we decide to be the church and you'll receive the power. So here's the great verse to do what? If we could bring it up, Acts 10, 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went around doing what? What did he do? Doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, for God was with him. The church just needs to do good. We need to do good. We need to put others first. Somebody said, Pastor, how do you explain joy? Real simple, Jesus, others, then you. That's it. You'll never forget it now. Jesus, others, you. That's the joy. That's the joy that we see partaking. So this is what we are to do. So it's real simple. It's pray and show kindness. Tell you a true story. And, and you wonder about the miracles, right, because you never see stuff coming. So I was living up in Humboldt County, and it was funny. So when people told me I was going, you know, when I told people I was going to Humboldt, they said, listen. They said, um, there's like no Christians up there, okay. And if they are, they're a little different type of Christian, okay. And I'm like, hey, I'm going because God has called me. I'm going to be a youth pastor, start a young adults ministry. I'm going. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. They just didn't tell me there was no Mexicans up there, okay. That was the only thing. It's like, uh, I mean, it's bad, but it's like you're one of three. Well, I own the other two because they're my kids. Okay, who's the other one? You know what I mean? It's like this is this. Like, I couldn't find Mexican food to save my life. Okay, I'm glad I know how to make it. So I'll never forget this. We're up there. Um, it, it was, you know, the church. The church I was at was doing good, but the youth ministry and stuff is just a slow go. It's just, you know, real. It's real liberal. Um, well, there's a whole lot of weed. I mean, let's just state the obvious. And so, you know, I've really got my back up against it. And I just remember the Lord speaking this to me. You got to go around just doing good. So no joke. I'm at the grocery store, and you know when you broke, Winco, come on, somebody. This is a Foods Co., Winco, anything with the last thing Co. except Costco is good, okay? So I'm at Winco, and I just happen to be checking out, and I'm like, okay, you know, you were getting our groceries. And I overhear this, I, by the way, I thought she was a single mom at the time, and I just didn't know her husband was already taking stuff back. And she kept talking to the um, to the cash register person, cashier. I was like, okay, well, we'll take that back. Okay, well, we don't got to get that. And I see her kids. And finally, it just got down to the part that was nearest and dearest to me. It was the little Debbie's and Hostess, okay? Like, that's just nearest and dearest to me. And so I saw the <laughs> That's funny, though, huh? <laughs> well, look at me. I work hard to maintain this figure, okay? Getting skinny is easy. All you got to do is stop eating. Okay, I got to go the extra mile and be biblical. When other people stop, I keep going, okay? I mean, shoot, it's hard to maintain this. And so I saw the kids, and I was like, oh, for, for the love of God, don't put, you know, don't put back the ding-dongs and the cupcakes here, okay? Like, we got to be able to get that. So I looked at my wife, and I'm like, hey, we need to help them. Like, this, you know, it just touched my heart. I was, you know, raised by a single mom for a lot of years, and so it just touched me, and I'm like, we got to help them. 
Little did I know what I was opening up Pandora's box, okay? So we, I, I just, I turned around while the mom was, the husband had came back and they were talking. And I was like, oh, it's perfect time. So I was like, hey, how much are they short? I was like, whoa, they short that much? That's a whole lot of ho-hos and ding-dongs and cupcakes. And I'm like, okay. So I looked at my wife, you know, because, you know, she was the budgeting person. I'm like, babe, we got to come through. You know, we can just say no to something else, right? So we paid the rest of the groceries nonchalantly. Just we dipped out, like walked out fast. You know, I'm not there to see my good works. It's to glorify the Lord. So I'm halfway out to the car, and this guy, big dude, comes running after us. Hey, stop. I'm from the hood. When someone big is running, you start running faster. Like, come on, babe, you got to pick it up, girl. <laughs> so, <laughs> got one kid, she got one kid, we running. And so, he goes, no, you need to stop. And I'm like, no, you don't, baby, you get to get in the car, forget the groceries, just throw the kids in the car, get in the car, start driving the car. So, finally, he's like, I need to talk to you. I did what any honorable man would do. I'm a man of God. I did what you would do as a man of God. You are the protector of your house. You need to protect your wife and your kids. So I did what you would do. I said, babe, you need to go talk to him, okay? <laughs> he won't hit you. He going to hit me. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I don't care what you say. That's good. That's good. So, uh, so she goes up. So she goes up to him, and he's like, thank you. I ran all the way out here to tell you thank you. Like, my kids don't know what to do. Why did you do this? So my wife just says, well, we're Christians. And my husband has a heart for people. Like, he, he wants people to be well fed. And so he says, well, where do you go to church? And, you know, we've all been here. You invite somebody, they say they're going to show up. They don't ever show up. Come on. You're like, okay, well, I'm going to text them again. Then they, they, oh, I'm going to be there for sure. I'm going to be there for sure. Save me a seat. Didn't show up. About the third time, what do you say? I ain't texting you no more. Shoo, you ain't coming. So I'm at church. So I'm at church. And uh, I'm minding my own business. And I'm thinking, he ain't coming. You know what I mean? They got like five kids. They ain't loading up all five kids. They're not coming. Right? And so I have my own youth service. And in the middle of my youth service, all these adults keep walking into our youth service. And a few of them are waving at me in the back. Others are giving me a thumbs up. Others of them are just smiling. We're so proud of you. And I'm like, what is going on? Like, what did I do? I mean, you would have thought like I rescued a kid or something. You know what I mean? I mean, just like, I mean, all, I mean, we had three services, every service. So finally, it's the last service where I get to actually go into church. And they're stopping me like I, like, like I had just defeated somebody, like Goliath. You know what I mean? And I'm walking in, and I'm like, what? They go, you're the talk of church today. And I'm like, what I do? They go, this guy came in at first service with this whole family, stood up and gave a testimony about how this other guy paid for all his groceries at Winco. And they just accepted Jesus. And so everybody's ecstatic about the one act of kindness brought a whole family to Christ. And I'm like, really? He actually showed up with his kids? You know, oh, great man of faith over here, of course. And the Lord moves in mysterious ways. Touch. You know? No. Like, I mean, I'm just so amazed at what the power of kindness can really do. You know, for those of you who really like studying the word, you just like really diving into the nuts and the bolts to the nitty and the gritty of it. If you go back and you watch Jesus' life, it is marked by people wanting a healing, but he gives them salvation. It's marked by that. Jesus, will you heal my, heal, heal my blind eyes while well, salvation has come to you today? Because I truly believe once you accept Christ, no matter whatever happens to you, you'll get a new body anyway. What good is it to be able to see, but you're always blind spiritually? What good is if God really does heal your heart, but spiritually you have a hardened heart? So we got to offer this to people. So we go around doing good. And then he goes on to say this. He goes on to say that the Holy Spirit will come on you. See, there's an indwelling and there's an infilling, right? You have the person, the power, the presence, and the promise of the Holy Spirit. So, yes, the Holy Spirit is what regenerates you and it quickens you and what becomes uh, perishable is now imperishable. Yes, your spirit. But then we need the Holy Spirit to come on us. Why? Because in John chapter 15, he says what? That you're going to bear fruit. Did you know you don't produce fruit? You just bear the fruit. Because the fruit's not of you, it's of the Holy Spirit. It's not of us. It's impossible for us to do. We are to bear 
the fruit. In other words, if we go to Galatians 5.23, if we could bring that up on the board, it's going to show you that there really is only one fruit. And that's the fruit of love. He says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit, one, in you. Look at that. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. If you're reading out the New King James, it says forbearance, right? That patience, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So we have so we have the seven, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we have these fruits, right? These fruits, it's kind of like an orange, one orange, but several pieces off that orange, right? So that love is there. That love is there, and then all these other fruit manifest out of it. Now listen, everybody always wants the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We want to speak in tongues. We want to get interpretations, gift of prophecy, and all that's amazing. I think that's wonderful, and yes, but if you have only the gifts and not the fruit, then you're a nut. That was a church joke. That was pretty funny. I worked all day on that, all right? So, and if we have the fruit and no power, then what's the purpose? It's a, it's a tandem. It's a both. It's, a, it's not an either or. It's an and. So here we go. We got the fruit, right? And this fruit is so that we can bear it. It's so that we can not bear it as in cumbersome, but bear it as in people can come eat. Hey, I'll tell you this. Nothing says love and nothing says good but a good piece of fruit off a good tree, especially when you are craving it. And so we're here to bear this fruit. And so I just want to, I just want to, I want to leave it to you like this. The best way is let me tell you another story. Has anybody here ever been plagued by spam mail? Spam mail. Okay, you thought you were signing up to win that car, but they got your email address, and now they're going crazy, right? So I'm going to tell you a true story. Has anybody here ever answered spam mail? I did. Don't ask me why. I'm part crazy. I think it's in the blood. It's in the DNA. But I answered a spam mail. So back when our church was smaller, uh, I would get the church emails, right? I'd get the church emails. This is a true story. You're never going to believe this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. It's a true story. So I get this spam mail. This lady reaches out to our church, and um, she says, hi, uh, I live in Hawaii, but my kid is going to go, my, my son and his best friend are going to go to school in Fresno. First off, who does that? Like, why do you leave paradise to come to hell? Okay, I live in Fresno, and I'm trying to get to Hawaii, okay? And so, like, have you been, in, have you been to Fresno in the summer? Like, people talk about the, you know, the crazes, we're going to detox. Just move to Fresno in July. You'll detox. You'll sweat 24-7 for the rest of the month, I guarantee you. That's detoxing, okay? So, anyway, so I'm like, okay, this has got to be so fake. So, she says, my son's going to come out and play football, and we're looking for a place to stand. I'm thinking, okay, there's where it is. She wants money. She wants money, right? I'm thinking, okay. So, I know it's fake, but I'm going to answer anyway. Okay, so great. Can't wait to meet your son um, and his best friend. Um, this is what I thought I'd do because, you know, i got to be spiritual because I'm a pastor. Why don't you meet us for Saturday night prayer? Here's the location to the church. I'll see you then. And I give her the time. So the time rolls around, and, okay, I'm thinking to myself, they're not going to show up because it's spam mail. About ten minutes later, this woman walks up with her son and her son's best friend. And I'm like, oh, snaps, this is real. Like, I thought I was just corresponding with somebody from the U.K. who's going to leave me a million dollars in pounds. You know what I'm saying? Come on, spam mail. And so she walks in with her son, and she says, okay, well, here's my son, Lemana, Lemana Chungum, and here's his best friend, Eric Hiranaka. We're from Oahu. Uh, we're from Oahu, and they, they, we need to find a place, and they're going to go to school, and my son's going to play football. And I'm like, is this real? Like, I'm looking at my wife like, this has got to be fake. And so she is, she's married to a Tongan, and I can't say that last name because it's all vowels, no consonants. And so, like, I'm like, I can't, I really, I just know her name is Penny. Hi, Penny. And so they're in my foyer, and I'm like, this is fake. And I just felt the Holy Spirit show kindness. So I'm like, okay, what do you need? She said, we're staying at the hotel right here. We'll see you for church in the morning, but we need to go look at these apartments. I said, well, let's go look at the apartments. Okay, so this is the part you're not going to believe. He married my councilman's daughter, and they're now my youth pastors. He's my workout buddy. Mana's my workout buddy. I did their wedding two years ago, and this girl, Bethany, she was in my youth group, 
and she followed me when I started my church. And now they've been married going on, well, they're in their second year of marriage. And he goes, he's finishing up his Bible degree at Fresno Pacific, and he's my youth pastor. Go ahead and look at your neighbor and say, I don't believe that. I don't blame you for not believing that. But can I share this with you? So that started what we call our Polynesian pipeline. I have, I have kids who now come from Hawaii to come play football at Fresno City, and every year we get new kids. Every year I get new names to try to pronounce. And now every year I've got a natural bodyguards walking around me. Have you seen them? They're big. They only come in one size. It's big. And they will eat you. Yeah, I walk into a place and they're like, who are these guys? Bodyguards. Well, who are you? Nobody yet, but one day when I get there, these are my bodyguards. That's what they even said to me. They go, uncle, we'll be your bodyguards when you're famous. I'm like, hey. <laughs> what other preacher got bodyguards <laughs> that can eat you? <laughs> and so we do. I just showed kindness. So, oh, you're going to like this one. Are you ready for this? Because I showed kindness, I've been to Hawaii twice. Oh, yeah, you don't got to clap for me. I was happy for me, okay? I just got done doing one of the guys who showed up, Reno Salanoa Sacopolo. Yeah, you like that? I did good. His real name is Va'ateo. See? I didn't know that, huh? Got fluent in that language. Watch this. Just did his wedding in Hawaii. They invited me out. Pastor, please come out here. All my family's here. Let's go do a wedding. Well, let's go. <laughs> Someone's got to suffer for the Lord. Why not me? Here my Lord, send me again and let me take my wife with me. I left the kids at home. Shoot, talk about God is good. I was visiting my dad in Omaha. It was 17 degrees. I got to Hawaii, it was 74. Sweet Jesus, I was made for this. But why? Because I wanted to show kindness. You'll never know where your one act of kindness will lead you. So what are we to do? The Holy Spirit comes on us and we might bear fruit. And here's the last one. That you will be my witness. My witness. There's no option to this. As a believer, we are to share faith. As a believer, we are to go the extra mile. As a believer, we are to continue to invite people. Now watch this. We're going to go home here. We're going to go home on two thoughts I have. Number one is, I'm not here to pick on you and to say, like, if you're not inviting people, this is so, you know, this is an epidemic. It's so horrible. But what I want to show you is one of the reasons why you might not be inviting people. So I didn't grow up in church. I grew up in Stockton. Like I said, I, I grew up in two parts, uh, two parts of Stockton. I grew up on the east side. Um, uh, back when I was a kid, they called it Oakieville on the east side. So I went to Roosevelt Elementary. So those of you from Stockton, you know what I'm talking about. I got, into so, I got into too many fights there. My mom moved out. My grandfather lived off Drake Street right off the 99. And so my mama moved out. We went to the north side of Stockton right off of Kelly Drive. If you're familiar with Kelly Drive, you'd probably said it went out of the frying pan and into the lake of fire, which I did. But uh, we ended up moving over there, Fairway West Apartments, and then my mom just kept going a little bit further north so I could get into Lincoln High School District, okay? So I wasn't a Christian. You, you got to see this. I was not raised in church. I did the whole Catholic thing for a minute, okay, until I got kicked out of catechism. So I just had no real affiliation with church. I was the anti-church person. I was the person who, who nobody ever suspected this would happen. Now, God's got a great sense of humor because now look what I'm doing. That's absolutely funny. I'm going to high-five the Lord when I see him. That was a good one. So, long story short, I find Christ. Now, here's what happens. I didn't have a hard time inviting people to Jesus. I didn't have a hard time inviting people to church because every single friend I had didn't go to church. I had a buffet of people to invite. Does this make sense? Fast forward two years, I realize that the majority of my friends now are already in the church. They either came and gave their hearts to Jesus, like I did, or I stopped associating with the friends who wanted to do the things I used to do in my past. So we begin to separate from people. And so George Bonnet did a study, and he found out this. The longer you're in church, the fewer people you invite. But I'm here to declare and decree unto you, the longer you're in church, it should be the more people you invite. Because you realize that heaven's a cool place and people need to come there with you. I have one objective, and that's to wreck hell why I populate heaven. My second objective is to humble the devil why I exalt Christ. So in order to do that, I have to be inviting people. I have to go everywhere I go. I need to know that I am a witness and that the reason he has empowered me is not so I could sing really good and play an instrument really well. Not that I could be under these bright lights and mics and preach to awesome people like you. 
But the reason he's empowered me is so that I could witness everywhere I go to a lost and dying world. That's it. That's why I live. That's why I serve. That's why I'm here. I don't want people to say he was a phenomenal pastor and a horrible believer. I'd rather them say he was a horrible pastor, but he was a phenomenal believer. Never grew a big church. He just grew big people. And he shared the love of Jesus everywhere he went. He led so many people to Christ. It was ridiculous. See, I don't want to get my priorities mixed up. I'm not looking to own my own plane and do all this other stuff. I'm just looking to share Jesus with people. Because that's what he asked me to do. He asked me to be a witness. So everywhere I go, this is my life's mission. This is why I do what I do. In conclusion, I I really want to put it to you in the simplest way that I can. Take me fishing and you'll realize that I am a stories person. So here's another one in conclusion. So my wife agrees with me on all that we do. She agrees with me when it comes to the church and to witnessing and sharing faith. So I ran into a guy at the gym again, and his name is Dave. And his, his nickname is Farmer Dave because Farmer Dave actually farms. This is what he does. And so Farmer Dave, okay, Farmer Dave, uh, when we started working out, he gave me to do all those crazy classes like spin classes and kettlebell classes and butts and guts and all this other stuff that I never wanted to do, just these crazy classes. But I went with them because I was sharing faith. And one day he says to me, hey, I'm looking for somebody to work in the office. And at that time uh, I was a poor church planter and we really needed the money. So I was like, hey, maybe my wife could work for you because, like, you know, maybe you pay really good and we could eat something other than beans and rice with Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. Right? So I'm like, maybe we could add meat to this plate here. So he says, I'd love to interview her. She goes, she does the interview. She goes, babe, I don't think I'm a good fit. This isn't going to work. I don't have all the skills. Right when she said that, he calls. And he says, hey, I would love to hire you. She says, but I don't even know how to do half the stuff. He goes, don't worry, I'll train you. I want to hire you. I'm like, oh, sweet Jesus, that's the Lord. Girl, you better go. Finally, we're going to upgrade to something other than turkey and chicken. Come on, beef, somebody. I'm ready. So she starts working, and she finds out. And I didn't really know this, but. Uh, Dave and his wife were having a hard time having children. So my wife prays, and bam, she gets pregnant. And then she gets pregnant again. And then she gets pregnant again. And then he's like, stop praying. (laughs) You've been there before? The womb is open, and a floodgate has happened here. We need to stop now. (laughs) So my wife comes home, and this is what she says to me. She says, come on up. You can come on up. I'm going to close. You can come on up. Yeah. So my wife says to me, she goes, babe, um, I'm done. It's time for me to move on, quit. I'm like, no, uh, no, honey, 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 like, 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 we're actually able to go to Costco and get a real basket of stuff now. Like, you can't quit. Like, we need the money. She goes, no, um, I'm, I'm done. Like, I'm going to tell them. And so unbeknownst to me, I actually show up on the day that she's going to hand in her resignation. Like, I I thought we were still talking about it. Come on, talking about it. Husband and wife conversation. Hello? And so I walk in, and she's letting them know, hey, like, this is it. And and, and this is what happens. Blows me away. He says, so what do I got to do to keep you? Do I got to give you a raise? And I'm over in the corner going, this is the Lord. Yes, give her a raise. Signing bonus even. I sense it in my spirit. I feel a moving of the spirit in my spirit. This is good. Ruth Chris Steakhouse, here we come. It's a signing bonus day. Like, I'm all, it's like getting income tax twice a year. Come on, somebody. I mean, I was really excited. And then she goes, no, the Lord is just moving me on. I'm like, really? Can, can, you, get, can you get the raise first? Like, just one paycheck with the raise. So he says this. You're never going to believe me. I'm telling you, I can't make this stuff up. He says, why don't I buy you a car? And in the moment, The heavens opened up, and that was the Lord. He was descending down. He was returning, and I sensed him. And he goes, no, I'm serious. I'll take you to the Lexus or the Range Rover dealer. Let's go get you a a car. I'm driving around an 87 Ford Astro Van Swag Wagon, okay? I'm like, yes, we are getting a car. I said, you need to honor your husband. You need to honor him for once in your life. You need to submit right now in Jesus' name, and you need to, you, you, you're going to keep this job, okay? I don't know what you two have worked, I don't know what you two have worked out, but she's staying. I mean, like, come on, help me. Well, she quit. 
I got into my swag wagon, Astro van, crying, talking about what could have been, grabbed a hold of the steering wheel, said, don't worry, baby, I love you, boo. You've been good to me. I've been good to you. Running around with three hubcaps, missing one. Come on, you know what you're talking about. Come on. <laughs> I get a phone call. What duct tape? Yeah. I get a phone call. I get a phone call. It wasn't a sweat. It wasn't an Astro van. It was an expedition. And it had three rims and one was missing. I get a phone call about a year later. And he says to me, it's Dave, pull over. He says to me, he goes, yo, Ann. Hey, what's up, man? He goes, uh, I got to tell you something. Real somber in his voice. I thought something happened. Like, serious. He goes, I went to church on Sunday. It's like, what? He goes, yeah, I gave my heart to Jesus. Me and my whole family. I'm like, what? For real, dude. You know, because I'm Mexican, I had an S on everything. I was like, for reals? Like, reals? Right? Kind of like, not Salinas, Salinas, right? So he goes, no, I'm serious. I gave my heart to Jesus. And he, this is what he said. He said, I just wanted to call and tell you that, you know, your wife was very influential. And then watch this. I got all mad. Like, I didn't say nothing on the phone, but I'm like, why is she getting all the credit? Dude, I went with you to every stupid class in the world at that gym, okay? Five o'clock in the morning, you got me and, you know, butts and gluts and whatever I was taking, a kettlebell spinning. Why do you go to a spin class? You ride a bike that goes nowhere, okay? If you ride a bike, it's got to go to a donut shop or some teppanyaki or something. And I'm just like, you're kidding me. Just give my wife credit over here. And I'm like, what? Then I heard the Lord say this, Anthony, some plant, some water. I give the increase for the harvest. Lifeline Church, this is what I'm saying to you. Some plant, some water, but you need to get ready for the harvest. I truly believe if you can catch this, catch this part right here. There might be a family member that you're still watering. There might be a friend at work that you've started planting. There might be somebody who you've already just started scattering seed. But if you could hold on and not grow weary, if you could hold on and say, I'll keep texting and I'll keep calling and I'll show up at the doorstep and I'll show up on Monday with a good attitude. If you could keep pressing in and pushing on, then you will be able to see one day the harvest that Jesus brings in. You will recognize that there may be an empty chair there right now, but that chair represents a person. That person has a story and that story matters to God. And when that day comes, you'll rejoice as if it's your own mother, as if it's your own father, your own cousin, your own sister, your own uncle, your own auntie. You're going to rejoice because God says, because of your faithfulness, I will bring you a fruitfulness. And this is what he guarantees us if we will not get weary, but we will understand that we were put here for a purpose, and that purpose is something we can never deny, which is we need to share our faith. We need to share our faith. It's not optional. Don't be duct tape, y'all. Let me pray for you. Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity for what you're doing here and now. Father, I pray that you would speak to us, the people that we should be influencing we should be speaking to. With every head down, every eye closed, I just want to stay in this attitude of prayer right now because I just know that there might be some people here right now that you were on the receiving end of that kind of invite, that you just got invited here today. And, you know, I just want to talk to two, two groups of people right now. You know, maybe you, ne you, you were a little bit like me. You never grew up in church. You don't know anything. You never knew anything about God. No, no one ever talked to you about this kind of stuff. You never knew church was like this. You never knew Jesus died on a cross for all your sins. And all you need to do is, is confess and, and lift that hand and say, you know, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus and he's going to make you whole. Maybe you never knew that. And I'm here to tell you today that today's your day. You're not here by surprise to him. God knows he had this day planned out. He's excited for you coming, and he's been, he's been outlining this. And he's ready for this. He, you being here is not a surprise to him. I also want to speak to a group of people. Maybe you, maybe you did grow up in church. Maybe, maybe you used to do this. You used to be real tight with God. Maybe you used to be close with him. You used to be in your Bible. You used to be, you used to be, you know, have that tight relationship, praying and all that stuff. But somewhere along the line just got distant and something happened maybe something literally happened that that dri drove a wedge in between your relationship with with yourself and God and I want to tell you today no matter what category you fall into no matter what 
no matter what group you're a part of, I want to tell you today's your day. Today's your day to give your life either to for the first time or back to Jesus to say, Jesus, I want to live for you. I want to give myself to you. And I'm, I'm, I'm done trying it my own way. I want to try it your way, Lord. So this is what we're going to do. On the count of three, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand and say, it's just a, it's just a little sign to say, Jesus, I'm all yours. I'm giving everything to you. So one, two, three. Go ahead, lift that hand up to the sky if that's you. Praise the Lord. I see your hand. Praise the Lord. I see your hand. Praise the Lord, I see your hand. And this is what we're going to do all together as a family. I want to pray this prayer together. So come on, say this with me. After I say it, you say it too. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I give my life to you. Make me new. Cleanse me from all my sin. Direct my path. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for every mistake I ever made. Every mistake I ever will make, I give myself to you in Jesus' name. Amen.